Amazon's upcoming MMO New World just had its first big, proper public gameplay reveal. And over the course of the epic 10-day preview, we got a pretty good impression of about where the game is now in its development, and also some insight into where the game is going to end up. This video is my evaluation of the 2020 August preview in its entirety over the course of about 80 hours of gameplay, so let's get started. What the game immediately confronts you with is its impressive presentation. New World utilizes Amazon's own Lumberyard engine, which is based off the prettiest engine ever TM, CryEngine. And it definitely shows. Render distance, texture quality, and model details are looking fantastic. And particular note has to go to the lighting. Lighting in games can often fill in for various graphical shortcomings or push visuals to the next level, and Amazon clearly agree with that, because the game is at its most screenshotable with the lighting effects on full display, particularly at dawn or dusk. And it really does look fantastic, almost unprecedented, in an MMO of this scale. The obvious comparison would be to Black Desert Online, and even there, I think New World stacks up pretty evenly. New World definitely has some rough edges in graphical presentation, though. Character models don't look amazing, and tend to have a bit of a plasticine person look about them, and there are a few areas that are just not polished yet, like the rain texture being a set of identical tiles, or the lava in some areas being rotating discs. A lot of the issues you'll encounter visually, though, are down to the game being in in my opinion, a relatively early state, more on that later, and the creases simply not being ironed out yet. Don't let that fool you though, visually New World is quite magical, and the game world is one of the best realized I have ever seen. The density of foliage, impressive atmospheric effects like mist, rain, and snow, awesome lighting, and a strong commitment to medium fantasy realism result in a world that is as cohesive as it is impressive to look at. Nothing really feels out of place, and the zones, monsters, towns, and wildlife all blend together very well to produce an incredibly authentic world. Different zones are not quite as distinctive as in your conventional MMO, that's for sure, and one might think that the world gets a bit samey after a while, but I think this is actually an intentional style choice, and I think it also works. I explored around pretty much everywhere, and I never felt bored, and I always felt like I was exploring into new territory. Although subtle, I do think that each zone is distinct enough and has its own feeling. My issue is that a lot of the towers, landmarks, forts, and so on are simply copy-pasted. I hope you like the structure and architecture layouts, because you'll be seeing the exact same one a hell of a lot wherever you go. The terrain variation definitely helps, and to be honest, somehow hides the the repetition very well, but I don't consider it good enough as it stands. I really want to see different layouts for buildings and different monuments or landmarks, much like the settlements, which all have their own style to an extent, but even that I'd like to see diversified more. Like I said previously, Amazon has done a great job taking their assets and integrating them into the terrain to make it feel unique, even though it is literally identical, and fixing this would require major reworks to a lot of areas, but I think it is necessary to raise the game to the heights it deserves based on its graphical fidelity. To be clear, there are some absolutely stunning individual landmarks, and the game does a great job of having these massive macro set pieces, but it's the more basic run-of-the-mill detail areas where the game falls short, which is an issue, but one far easier resolved than if the former was a problem. It's not a problem of style or quality, simply quantity. And as long as Amazon don't rush their release, I don't foresee issues here. Performance is solid too, although perhaps not as optimized as I was expecting. I was experiencing some issues on the higher settings to the point where I think there might be some kind of bug with the very high settings. Sometimes it was okay, around 80 frames per second at 1440p, but other times, seemingly at random, I will be dropping down to 30 or 40 frames per second. This might be linked to an issue the game currently has where it slowly devours all of your memory the more you alt-tab, draining your frame rate before eventually melting the game world and crashing itself and all your other programs too. Needless to say, I don't think that will be an issue on launch, but it was a pretty common issue for a lot of players during the preview. I have a fairly powerful machine with a 9900K and a 2080 Ti, so I ended up okay, but some of my lads did have a lot of stuttering issues and frame drops, so that's something that definitely needs to be looked into. 
Overall, and bugs aside, I would say the performance is acceptable, especially considering how many players are on the screen at any given time, and during the wars, the 50v50 PvP, I was impressed at how the frame rate remained solid. The only thing that seemed to phase the game was if a huge amount of particle effects were being displayed, so not bad at all. Server performance, in my experience, was similarly flawless. I had a few issues on the last day of the preview, and occasional desynchronization issues throughout with some bonus rubber banding here and there. But again, considering the stage the game is at and the number of players involved in some activities, I think it's very impressive. Amazon definitely flexing their muscles on this one, and I have no doubt it will only be better on launch. I will add that I did do some research into this, and some servers did have some pretty bad lag issues in the wars and even in the open world, but again, I imagine that's simply some bug squashing that needs to get done. Tying the presentation together is genuinely exceptional sound design. Music, combat effects, monster noises, and the environment itself are all at an extremely high standard matching the visuals. When you walk through a forest, you'll hear the sounds of all the players chopping down trees or picking away at rocks and being ganked by multiple wolves. It makes for an incredibly immersive experience. Each settlement and each zone has its own theme song, and that really sells the atmosphere on another level and and sets the tone for what you're going to find exploring around. There's some great variety too. Earlier zones have a more homely, welcoming, yet still wistful theme, whereas a lot of the higher level zones, particularly the corrupted ones, have a much more ominous, ethereal sound that, while being pleasing to the ears, still has a very clear edge to it, indicating that something is terribly, terribly wrong with this forsaken land. The music before wars and invasions definitely deserves special praise too. You'll be ready for action after listening to it. It's a shame that it just completely stops when the war starts. Describing it isn't really the best way to review this, so I'll just play some for you right now. I love the music of New World, and it's one of the things that actually impressed me the most about the game. My only real issues with the music is that sometimes it just doesn't play. Sometimes it's distorted and sounds like hell itself is using instruments on you. Transitions between tracks, particularly ambient and combat, feel pretty stilted sometimes, and well, the combat music in general will dissolve your brain after a while and probably needs to be redone. It's incredibly repetitive and not up to the standard of the other music, in my opinion. It's just nowhere near as interesting, and although it does fit the overall theme of the game, it just doesn't have the same personality that the rest does. My other complaint is that I just want more. You'll be hearing the same fairly short music tracks over and over again in a given zone, and they could definitely all use a few more. But again, this is more of a polish thing, and I'm sure it's in the works. Again with the polish is the game lacking voice acting. Not a deal breaker for me personally, but I do expect it in any modern AAA title, especially in an RPG type game where world building is paramount. It would be a real shame if voice acting ended up being a missing piece of the puzzle for New World, given the high standard set by the rest of the audio-visual elements. There has also been some criticism of the character lines during casting spells. I'm not sure I actually agree, having thought about it, though. Having characters say magic words to cast spells is some pretty nice roleplay, and they are more amusing than annoying, in my opinion. Consider me an official WHOA apologist, but, you know, I'll concede that some extra variety couldn't hurt. 
The final part of the game's presentation is the interface. It's a bit of a mixed bag. The combat interface is super clean and minimalistic. Stamina, mana, health, consumables, cooldowns, and status effects are all displayed efficiently and clearly. Equipped weapons are showed as full-sized icons, which is a bit odd, but not obnoxious. And all combat information like damage output, ammunition, and aim is all clear. The camera zooming in whenever using ranged weapons takes some getting used to as you'll feel the view and camera control change but it's necessary because of the action combat system. I'll add that aiming uphill is very weird because of the way the camera pivots and forces you to angle your camera in extreme ways, which I think needs some work, but that's more of a combat issue rather than an interface one. You might be put off by the lack of minimap. Instead of one, the player is given a compass bar at the top of the screen, which has various markers on it to help navigate. This is obviously not as useful as a minimap, but this is again a deliberate choice by the developers, I think. They want you to have to actually engage with the game visually instead of relying on a minimap to spot allies, enemies, or landmarks. The system works well enough, and I've never found myself really missing the minimap, to be honest. That's a big mark of New World in general. There are things in New World missing, like a jump button, that are present in other MMO titles, but because of the implementation of the game's mechanics, I never found myself really missing them. What I do miss, though, is a decent quest log implementation. New World's one is just plain scuffed, albeit mostly due to bugs. You can only have three quests pinned to your interface at the same time, which isn't great, especially as the game doesn't dynamically alert you when you get close to an area you have a quest in. This makes it very easy to miss quests. What exacerbates this is the fact that sometimes quest markers just don't show up whatsoever. This is particularly frustrating when trying to hand in quests. You'll finish a quest, but you won't see who finishes it. Luckily, the compass bar can still tell you, but the main map will be completely clueless, making it extremely easy to miss some turn-ins and then fail to follow up with the chain. Something else which needs work is having multiple quests in a single location. The markers sort of overwrite each other, so you can only see one of the quests until you finish the other, which can make things very difficult to keep track of. I think fixing the bugs and then extending the amount of pins and also notifying the player and auto-pinning nearby quests, maybe in a separate section of pins, will fix all the issues. The chat window has the godlike feature of global chat. I think global chat is amazing, especially as it's cross-faction. I was able to gloat that the tax rates were increasing when we defended our territory and reap all of the salt in my private messages afterwards. Just in general, it keeps the game social and you get a lot of fun interactions out of it, which is great. I might just be incompetent, but I do find the chat window a bit cumbersome. Replying to people or inviting them requires you to click on their name, not just any part of the message, which is a bit awkward. The color coding of different message types is effective though, and you can customize the size of the chat window, which is convenient, as it eats a pretty big amount of screen space by default. There's not much else to say about the interface. It all works well and looks pretty good. The progression updates of leveling up, mastering a weapon, crafting or gaining reputation are all especially good and really satisfying. It's clear the developers had the dopamine hunters in mind when designing the character system. What the game desperately lacks is an extended party option. Parties of players are limited to five, which is absolutely horrible for anything open world. Often you'll be playing with a pretty large group of 10, 20, or even more. It can be very difficult to lead these groups because people have no idea where you are or what's going on and start running around like headless chickens. A squad feature like Wars or just having company members marked on the map would greatly ease open world action. Additionally, company management is missing some key features. You cannot create a new rank or rename existing ones, and our normal members were left unable to withdraw anything from the treasury without being promoted to an officer, so they were fighting for nothing but the privilege to make me and my inner circle rich. A massive company item storage, based in the territory they own, is in order as well, to help players pool resources together for crafting, or even to hand them over to dedicated traders who can get the best deals for the company, so lazy tiny brains like me don't have to deal with the quite complicated player economy that sports different taxes, prices, and non-global storage in different towns. Those who enjoy spreadsheets will have an entire new world of profit-making adventures, and I think a surprising amount of players will enjoy the roleplay of being a humble water essence merchant. 
and simply maximizing profit by playing the economy of the game, which will be much more engaging than most MMOs. Not quite the EVE Online level, but more than AFKing in one spot with the trading post window up. The settings menu could also use a bit more fleshing out as well, for more fine-tuning of the visual appearance. The camera shake in particular has gotta go. I'd also like to see the field of view extended a bit too. That has more competitive implications, but I find the current field of view to be a little on the low side. The final minor gripe is that the interact key is the same as the give up key for being at death's door, and it has no hold to confirm, which can end up trolling you very hard if you're trying to revive or interact just as you get taken out. The last item of note in the interface is the inventory. It's okay, but my main issue is that it's sorted automatically and not by the player, which makes managing it a real pain sometimes. And moreover, when you pick up an item, its gear score and perks are not displayed until you mouse over the item, so you have no idea if you just got an epic Omega item or some complete junk, which can lead to some disappointment. I think the inventory just needs a few extra options or tweaks to make it finished. I think it could be a little wider and maybe show gear score on items. Tooltips are maybe a bit too giant, but they get the job done and are very clear. Gear being sorted through various filters and with a search bar does make sense for item drops, because there is no meaningful item slot system like a lot of other MMOs, as it's done all on weight instead. But I really think utilities in particular could use the ability to be manually positioned for usability. A few other bonus tools could be salvage all below a certain tier or quality, and repair all equipped gear with one button, because that can be a mild inconvenience. With that out of the way, we can talk about mechanics now. First, as a warm-up before the controversial combat system, is the progression system. Character progression has three main sections, attributes, equipment, and weapon mastery. As is the RPG way, leveling up allows the player to gain a point in one of five attributes. Strength, dexterity, intelligence, focus, and constitution. Their names are all very descriptive and function as you might expect. Strength increases damage with melee weapons or thrown weapons. Dexterity increases damage with projectile weapons and certain melee weapons. Intelligence makes your character better at magic. Focus regenerates mana and reduces cooldowns. And finally, Constitution increases your maximum hit points. The player attributes are well designed, and I like that some weapons scale differently with different attributes, and some attributes affect more than one weapon type. This is particularly pertinent because you can equip three weapons at once, and swap with no cooldown. Attributes also aren't overwhelmingly powerful, so even if you don't fully dedicate to one, it doesn't mean you're useless with a certain weapon. In fact, base damage on weapons and some abilities is perhaps a bit on the high side now, and the unmodified mana regeneration is significantly higher than I would expect with no focus investment. These values could be toned down in favor of making attributes a bit more impactful when pushing your character in a certain direction. However, having attributes not completely dictating effectiveness perfectly complements the classless system as it encourages players to mix and match different weapon types to create a fleshed out build, but also of course facilitates simply going all in on a single type of combat, essentially allowing the player to build their own class as they see fit. If you know me, you'll know that I absolutely love hybrid builds and the freedom to craft a personal playstyle, so I wouldn't want to see attributes end up restricting what you can get done too much. There's a balance to be struck here, and if base damage is reduced, it probably shouldn't be by too much as it could risk pigeonholing players. Moving on, we arrive at a definite strong point for the game, itemization. Items have quality, gear score, and a tier. Tier dictates at what level you can use items, and gear score determines how good that item is, and better quality items can have more special bonus effects known as perks. Gear score feels very significant, and getting a 50 gear score increase can represent a big jump, to the point where it can overrule perks. Replacing a purple item with a green one was reminding me of moving between expansions in World of Warcraft, but it keeps the loot drops interesting while leveling. Getting an upgrade can make your life a lot easier, particularly a weapon drop. This obviously is reduced as you play more, and it becomes less special, but I think it will be a great hook for new players, and there is always a level of excitement when looting a boss mob or a high level chest. There is another property of items specific to armor. Armor takes form in one of three weights, light, medium, and heavy. 
As is the typical roleplay, light armor is good against magic, but no good for surviving physical attacks, medium is a bit of both, and heavy makes you a complete lightning rod for wizards, but nigh impervious to physical attacks. This is further complicated by the fact that in New World, heavy armor really is heavy, and the more cold hard steel you put on, the less you can roll around all over the place. The compensation here is that you don't need to use up as much stamina to block attacks because of your massive bulk. I'll get into this more in the combat section, but because of the class system, this does have some pretty interesting ramifications. For a start, you can mix and match these types to both manage your protection level and your total weight, which dictates how good your dodge roll is. You'll also need to maintain multiple sets for different situations. If a boss only does magic damage, then your full plate isn't going to help whatsoever, and if you need mobility, for example, in open world PvP, particularly in outnumbered situations, light armor is going to end up being significantly better, as heavy, while durable, is much easier to lock down, and has a harder time dashing in and out of combat engaging multiple foes, because it's much more suited to blocking than dodging. A lot will come down to playstyle too. It's definitely possible to make a heavy frontline mage in full armor, but equally, you could play a similar setup with light armor to withstand enemy mages and evade physical attacks to make up for the lack of mitigation. The weight system seems very simple on the surface, but it actually creates a huge amount of possible approaches to character roles and decisions for the player to make when deciding what to run into battle with. Fantastic. Equipment perks themselves then even offer even more customization. There are plenty of diverse item perks that will have a lot of interesting applications, like rings bestowing the boon of dealing more stamina damage on a third consecutive attack, or mana restoration on hit, martial weapons enchanted with fire magic, or even making armor lighter so you can get away with wearing heavier armor and maintaining a real dodge roll. The amount of customization and min-max potential the game has is very high, at least enough to satisfy a moderately greasy nerd. Just getting to an optimal set of gear will probably be quite the endeavor because crafting and item drops both have heavy doses of RNG when it comes to what perks items have. But that is a story for when we get to the crafting system. Items can also be fitted with gems to further increase attributes, up to a maximum of 5 points per gem at the highest tier. This is a really big part of completing your build, as using all gem slots with max tier gems will add almost as many attribute points as being level 60 allows you to assign, so they are very, very powerful. Perhaps one of the reasons why attribute scaling is conservative. Expect some lower level smurf characters juiced up on high tier gems, destroying hapless players. Gem socket systems are a staple of a lot of RPG games, and it fits well here allowing characters to further refine their build and just have more points to spend in terms of character development, which also helps with investing in more than one combat style. Weapon Mastery is another excellent system. You can level up your mastery of each weapon to 20, which takes a fair while to do, and you'll have 19 mastery points to spend at the end. Weapons have two distinct trees from which you can mix and match, but not pick everything of course. This leads to a really interesting series of choices that can really customize your gameplay. For example, you could focus on heavy backstab damage and combos with the sword, or you could go for a much more direct option with leaping and whirling strikes for a full frontal assault. Firestaff diverges into deadly artillery or a close combat battle mage, and the infamous hatchet gives you the choice of a dexterous throwing weapon or a whirling lunatic berserker. This is the case for every weapon, and the developers did a great job of creating a lot of decisions for the player to make on exactly how they want their combat experience to go. Some of the traits are not super exciting, like some flat extra damage, but there are some really cool ones, like landing a hit after a block dealing extra damage in retaliation, or landing three axe throws in a row for more damage, or becoming an unstoppable juggernaut after finishing off a knocked over enemy with a hammer. Not every trait has to be game changing, but a lot of them are little bonuses that will subtly affect your playstyle and add little mini games to your gameplay, like shooting the legs of your enemies to slow them down with a bow. 
This sort of thing is exactly what a combat system like New World needs. A simple basic foundation, which is then embellished and enhanced with these little influences that shape your approach to an encounter, and indeed what you need to be looking out for in your opponents. Being able to pick what you want from both trees really gives you a surprising amount of options, and considering you have three weapons at any given time, you can mix and match different playstyles on different weapons, and even have some of both going at the same time, to really fill out your kit, or do the opposite and specialize heavily to fulfill your role in a large group. Needless to say, I give the weapon mastery system my seal of approval, and I'm looking forward to messing around with it with my company to create the ultimate war machine with some gratuitously overcomplicated synergies. Character progression in New World is surprisingly intricate for what on the surface can appear to be a simple system, and just figuring out what exactly is optimal will not be a simple task, and is very likely going to be highly situational depending on your role, strategy, and group composition. This is a very good thing for the longevity of the game, as long as the developers keep a handle on the game balance and don't allow one strategy to be completely overpowered, there are a lot of ways the game can play out, and the arms race of figuring out how to counter different approaches to the game, and coming up with new ones should keep it fresh, especially as perks and indeed the other progression systems like the variety of weapons on offer are almost certainly going to be expanded upon after, if not before, launch. I think Amazon did a great job with these progression systems, and it's clear a lot of work went into the design here, and it's produced a highly compelling result. Now it is time to discuss the most important system of the game, which of course is combat. Combat in New World is a Dark Souls inspired action system and is definitely one of the hottest points of debate around the goodness of New World, and getting to the bottom of it is not as simple as you might think. The combat centralizes around a few key points, stamina, stagger, and grit. Stamina is required to dodge roll or maintain a block, Stagger is what happens to you when you get hit, and Grit is a mysterious mechanic that isn't very well explained, but what it allows you to do is cover yourself in white smoke to use certain abilities while ignoring Stagger in exchange for some stamina if you get hit. Moving on to talk about armaments, melee weapons have a light attack and a heavy attack. These are pretty self-explanatory. The heavy attack hits much harder and staggers more, but needs a charge time. And ranged weapons have a basic attack, but you can headshot. There's definitely something to be said for action combat as a concept. Even though the combat is fairly simple when you get right down to it, the act of chopping down foes and really having that meaty feedback of hits properly landing is great. And even better than that is the active defense of being able to raise your shield to block anytime you want or dodge out of lethal swings. There's a reason why this recipe works well for so many single player action games. It's very satisfying to pull off and learning to anticipate enemies and counter them is great. You may not have many abilities and attacks, but when and how you decide to use them is critical, and decisions have a weight to them that more traditional MMOs cannot provide, which does create a remarkable amount of depth from a limited moveset. This depth is compounded because of the character progression systems discussed previously. A lot of the nuance in the combat is going to be derived from the way players choose to approach the game through itemization and weapon mastery choice, and the resulting play and counterplay from different players' choices interacting with each other. I think this was an intentional move from Amazon as well. Going with a simpler combat system compared to a lot of MMOs can make it more accessible, and the complex progression can keep the game interesting for more invested players. The accessibility does crumble a bit under the weight of stagger and stamina management, but I still think it stands to an extent. There are a few issues though that might be tricky to resolve. Attacks don't really have a lot of momentum to them, which really sucks when chasing enemies down. You can almost catch up to someone while sprinting, try and take a swing, and then watch your character literally come to a halt for the entire animation lock while the foe simply runs away from you. I think this lack of momentum is where the combat really does suffer in terms of fluidity. This is exemplified in the very long aftercast after pretty much everything, particularly certain abilities where your attack is over, but you can't do anything for a moment. I don't particularly mind having to commit to a swing, but there are these awkward locks after an action is completed that can feel very frustrating. 
I mentioned that some of the issues might be tricky to resolve for a reason, and I'm going to talk about that now. Stagger and locking result in some quite brutal gameplay sometimes. It's not uncommon to be able to chain a player for upwards of 5 seconds, or pretty much forever if you're outnumbering, resulting in situations where the player doesn't really have options to recover. The trouble is, is that this is probably fairly intentional, and changing it too much would dilute the action combat and make it so that fights would take a very long time indeed, and swing the frustration in the other direction. However, I see this becoming a big problem, particularly as combos are figured out and players get better at the game. Right now, I think you end up in a no-win situation pretty quickly, and you just have to watch as your health gets heavy attacked away. I'm not a fan of losing agency for prolonged periods of time because, well, it's just not fun at all unless you are the one doing it. Perhaps some rebalancing could be done to how quickly the player can recover from a heavy attack stagger so it doesn't just go on seemingly forever with no real recourse or add some diminishing returns because right now it's a little extreme. The shield toolkit in particular can be simply disgusting for lining up endless chains of stuns, knockbacks and heavy attacks leading to a fun gameplay experience. The game also works out significantly better with relatively even numbers, and if you're outnumbered you might end up having a very unfortunate time unless you're up against an army of lemmings. What I mean by the game working well with larger numbers is that many of these features of the combat aren't really so much of an issue in the wars. Your team can peel you out of stagger locks and running away forever isn't an option because of the objectives. You also start to see the depth of the combat system play out, particularly in the variety. I think there are a lot of different weapon and armor weight combinations to fill different roles and playstyles, which is fantastic. There will be some of this in open world, but you'll be pushed very hard towards light armor, mobility, and burst damage, because wading into a potentially uneven fight without an actual dodge roll is a great way to get left click to death. It's funny actually, this is very much mirroring how Guild Wars 2 World vs. World plays out. You see different roles in big Zerg fights and all the top roaming builds have very high mobility, evasion and burst, so I guess I can't complain. New World doesn't have a stealth mechanic aside from crouching or lying on the ground though, which is a good thing, so at least you're safe from the classic Five Thief roaming montage squad. Larger scale fights are also where the fun coordination happens, like chaining hammers with meteor showers or light staffing in all at the same time to lead a shock attack. I've got to say, it's great, and even in the few pretty scuffed wars I participated in with around 15 to 20 of my company on Discord, it was a lot of fun trying to move around the map correctly and push as a team. As Amazon Game Studio did say, war is the pinnacle of New World PvP. The synergy between different weapon combinations and player coordination is where the combat really shines, and I hope to see that developed on even more with additional weapons and abilities. Speaking of abilities, I've been far too positive so far in this review, so let's talk about my least favourite thing about the combat system. My least favourite thing about the combat system is the way skill cooldowns work. You develop your mastery of a weapon and can pick up to three skills per weapon, but all the slots share a cooldown. That is to say, if you use a two minute cooldown defensive ability, it can put your six second axe throw on a two minute cooldown as well, which well, it's not great. I understand the purpose here is to reduce spam and make the player think about where they place their abilities on the hotbar, which is actually an interesting minigame to be fair, but it just overall feels bad. And so limiting in what you can do as a player with combining different weapons. You can just about combo two weapons together, but to actually get value out of three is a bit of a stretch right now, and it just doesn't make sense to me that bashing someone with a shield suddenly means I can't use my magic spells all of a sudden. This is one of the things that I was referring to when I said the issues might be hard to resolve. Fully unleashing cooldowns might lead to some even more degenerate gameplay, considering my previous comments on stun locking and stagger. 
So I think the game would have to be rebalanced a fair bit to make it work, adjusting damage, cooldowns, and maybe even requiring the player to have better defensive abilities innately, or a longer wind-up on weapon swapping and so on. But I really think it's the way to go. If you've got a combat system with a triple weapon swap with no cooldown on swapping, then it's an absolute crime not to have some epic synergy between all three weapons being heavily present in the gameplay. You might be able to master your weapons, but to truly conquer a Turnum, you must become the lord of consumable usage. Somehow even more so than in Classic WoW. There is a consumable for almost everything. Healing, mana, health regeneration, crafting bonuses, bonus damage versus a certain enemy, damage reduction versus a certain enemy, and so on. It's a pretty cool system that rewards players for putting in effort and preparing for battle well, and also creates some really cool social interactions with players where you craft potions and then share them with your team before engaging in action. I think the durations and restrictions are a little bit harsh on a lot of them though. They're often very, very brief, some only five minutes, or even getting deleted when you swap weapons, which is maybe a little extreme. Pushing the baseline up to around 30 minutes would probably make them much less annoying to use. This would make sense because wars and invasions happen to be 30 minutes long. The perfect time to oil up. Consumable spam might be a little over the top as it stands right now, as they essentially give you borderline infinite resources in a fight if you play your cards right, so perhaps a slight cooldown could be in order. Another particular consumable linked mechanic I'm not a big fan of is Corruption. If you're near a source of Corruption, you'll periodically take unavoidable damage, and the stronger the Corruption, the faster it happens, essentially mandating Corruption potions. These of course have a very short duration and aren't exactly difficult to get, but I just don't like the mechanic as a whole. Unavoidable damage has no real place in a skill-based action game like New World, I think. Corruption potions could still be a thing, but instead of unavoidable damage, make the monsters have a component to their attacks or even special moves that deal massive corruption damage that could be mitigated with consumables. As it is right now, corruption damage is an annoyance at best that is essentially just a gear check, except it's consumables. With max tier corruption potions, it won't even really bother you outside of having to chug a potion once in a while, so it ends up not really doing anything. The focus on consumables in New World is an interesting one, and I think we need to see how it plays out. It can be a source of extra depth, but it also might end up obfuscating the gameplay somewhat. I also live in terrible fear of a situation where micromanaging your inventory and bringing in fresh consumables by opening the inventory mid-combat very, very quickly, grabbing more potions to your hotbar and then resuming battle becomes an important strategy. Some would say that adds to combat, I would say that is the road to insanity. Another pretty interesting feature in New World Combat is level scaling. Lower level players are scaled when fighting higher level players, and vice versa. This isn't the case in PvE, but you don't just randomly fail to hit mobs because they're a higher level than you. It's really good that your lower level friends can leap into battle with you, and be effective in a way that just isn't possible in other MMOs. They'll still get splattered without support more than a regular level player, but that's still a really good feature for not getting left behind, and being able to include your noob friends, even with a significant level disparity in endgame PvP, is awesome. This does have some odd effects though. Players lower level than you will hit you harder and take significantly less damage than if they were the same level. This seems to be pretty aggressive sometimes, and occasionally ends up with lower level players looking like they have an advantage even. Another unusual quirk of this system arises from itemization. You can equip tier 5 gems in lower level gear if you can afford it, and get some insane stat gains at a very low level. The scaling might then make this really interesting against higher level players, and will massively skew even level fights. This could end up in players creating low level characters, deliberately not leveling them, and then demolishing some noobs for a montage. This Twinking behavior is not unheard of as a concept in MMOs, but I think it runs contrary to what Amazon wants to accomplish with their sense of fairness in PvP, and being able to run around bashing lobbies who might be expecting an even fight, only to be confronted with a much more experienced player with far superior stats than they're likely to have, doesn't fit into that in my opinion. 
I didn't have time to test the scaling in depth, so it might be working correctly, but it did appear off at some times. On the whole though, the scaling is a very good mechanic, and was particularly useful in the preview, as of course I was no lifing a bit, while most others weren't, and it meant that they could get engaged in war and the later stages of the game, instead of being left behind completely, or stomped in PvP by all the sweaty tryhards. Overall, I think the combat of New World is a bit misunderstood, and got bashed somewhat unfairly during the test. However, when players have got the hang of it and it gets a proper round of polish, it should end up being quite something, I think. One of the reasons why the combat and the game in general took such a beating was also because of the context the combat was demonstrated in most of the time, namely PvE. And this is going to be an epic segue into a discussion of the content systems too. The trouble with New World PvE is that for all the surprising depth of the combat system in PvP, the combat in PvE is pretty much just left-click spam, particularly on the Hatchet, which has some absolutely obscene abilities for farming mobs. You can go completely immortal, which extends on kill, and a kill will also heal you for 20% of your hit points. In addition, you are strongly rewarded for just left-clicking, because each successive swing does more damage, and even worse, Tanking hits while berserking actually just straight up makes you do more damage as well, leading to, well, an absolute clown fiesta is what it leads to. Playing New World properly, that is to say, dodging attacks, blocking and picking your opportunity, is pretty much rendered pointless for the vast majority of content, because rushing mobs with hatchet left click just gets the job done. You can get some absolutely insane combos running with the hatchet and pretty much just go god mode forever, which is quite a lot of fun, admittedly, but not the best showcase for action combat. In addition to this, the baseline mechanics of mobs also aren't the best designed either for the combat system. To prevent enemies from just getting hard locked immediately, they all have at least one grit attack to break out from stagger. The trouble is, is that quite a lot of the time they'll use these with pretty much no warning and with an almost instant animation, making it a bit weird to play around. Some of them you can definitely react to, but quite a lot of them are so fast you're better off just spamming and eating the attack. This essentially means the game is punishing you for playing correctly and rewarding you for playing badly. And this meant that everyone playing the game on stream made it look a little bit scuffed. Fortunately, the solution here is pretty simple. Make the grid attack slower, far more powerful, and maybe even leave the monster vulnerable for a time after successfully avoiding or interrupting the attack. It's incredibly important that the game incentivizes you to play correctly, or you'll end up with another auto-attack simulator. All of this got further blown up by the nature of open-world PvE Zerg Fests. The PvE in New World, just like PvP, is utterly sandblasted down to smooth brain levels simply by having a large amount of players outnumbering a smaller amount of enemies. It's pretty engaging to play out in the world while solo or duo, especially in the elite areas with extra strong monsters. But the trouble is that when you scale up your group, the enemies just can't handle you. This is made more extreme with the downstate. Even if the bad guys do get you, allies can revive you pretty easily. This meant that even with horrific gear, no consumables, and with a bunch of level 30 and 40 players, we were able to get Merc Guard, the ultimate endgame zone done, with only a few complications. The portals did present more of a threat there, but even they fell with a bit of a leg up. So the open world PvE gets Zerg down hard, and the developers knew this. So what they did was make all the high-end enemies do massive damage, respawn insanely fast, and have a lot of stagger resistance. And here is where the memes begin. Because a lot of enemies almost break the rules of the combat system, you end up in a situation where your strategy is limited to either Zerging or extreme kiting, because attempting to actually tussle and melee range directly with these monsters is just insanely punishing. Punishing. They'll happily ignore your attacks and break your block in one swing, and then one-shot you. And this scales pretty hard too, when there are a huge amount of elite enemies about the place. Now it turns out that this isn't too bad, because a lot of content is designed with a large player count in mind, but to be honest, it's actually the biggest area where the combat really doesn't work super well in my opinion, and I'm not sure if it can be made to shine either. I think the developers know this as well because they are moving towards instant PvE, in the form of arenas and invasions. 
As a quick bonus meme, I want to point out that it's absurdly easy to hardcore grief in open world PvE elite areas, opted in or out. Running through an elite area and dragging enemies onto your player enemies will often just straight up end small or medium sized groups and they really can't stop you doing it either, which I'm sure will be a barrel of laughs when people figure that out. Another massive issue with a lot of the elite areas is the borderline broken mob AI and respawn rates. Attempting to get into these zones with a relatively small group can be a living hell, because mobs will seemingly pull from nowhere or for absolutely no reason and bring the entire dungeon with them. And when I say entire dungeon, I mean it. Monsters in the room you just cleared, or indeed the room you are still in, will respawn insanely fast. This is clearly because the developers intend you to bring a large group to some of these areas, but it's also very inconsistent. Not all elite zones are like this, and there is absolutely no scaling, leading to mass frustration in smaller groups and unbelievable experience and loot farms in massive groups. I doubt this is intentional though, or at least I certainly hope it isn't, because I actually really really enjoyed pushing through Eridanus with a bunch of lower level players, except when, of course, we set one foot wrong or a fresh helpful player arrived and we got rushed by an army of respawned tree people. The aforementioned instanced PvE also really makes me question the direction of the game, unfortunately. There is one boss in the game right now, the Corrupted Spriggan. It does have some basic mechanics like spawning a few ads, and the arena system is pretty scalable, which is good, and it's awesome that players actually watch as you enter the arena to take on the beast. The problem is that it's very mechanically simple and suffers the same issues as a lot of the elite areas. Melee players get punished pretty hard and ranged players are not threatened whatsoever. Future bosses need to reward melee play more and also at least try to target and shut down ranged players more. Our kills of the Spriggan were just melee players trolling the boss trying to poke him a bit while our archers shot him in the head until it died. Not exactly the most riveting gameplay. Tightening up the DPS check would probably pile on the pressure a bit to get some huge damage numbers too, but if New World wants to compete with literally any other PvE MMO, then they'll need a lot more than this. I think particularly in the area of mechanical complexity. More special moves, intelligent AI, multiple phases, all that sort of thing. It's definitely possible to have group PvE bosses that function with the New World combat system. Just look to the Souls games that inspired it, of course. But this is probably the area of the game that needs the most work, and the current state of group PvE is currently my biggest area of concern for the game. It's clearly in the very early stages, and Amazon had better have some tricks up their sleeve. This theme has continued in Invasions as well, and a lot of the PvE actually, but more on that later. Invasions are PvE sieges where NPCs charge your fort and try to destroy your settlement. Sounds great on paper, to be honest, but I'm not a fan of the implementation. Instead of a dynamic attack, the enemies just spawn in waves. Set types of enemies will rush your gates, including a few bosses, and try and break through. And that's it. The exact same waves, every time. PvE naturally has a level of repetition, but usually there are mechanics involved, not just endless waves of trash mobs. And that's essentially what invasions are. And the AI can be really wonky too, and sometimes just ignores the players. This is particularly true with the boss mobs, which just go in deep. This is probably intentional, because otherwise it would be far too easy just to mess around with the mobs forever and shut them down with siege. But it really doesn't feel good at all. Very, very static. And I think invasions are just going to feel like an absolute chore after the first few times. Bear in mind, if you don't participate, your territory gets de-leveled a bit, so these are not optional. In case you can't tell, I think invasions are a tough sell, and probably need a complete rework to avoid becoming painful. Making them fully open world I think could rectify this, allowing all players nearby to get in on the effort and contextualizing them, making them very cinematic in the world. But the real issue lies in the waves of enemies. New World is a game that impresses me with its immersion, and there is nothing less immersive than static spawns of enemy waves. 
I want to see a massive swarm of enemies spawning, amassing outside the fort, and then watch as they try to set up siege weaponry, conduct foul rituals to summon giant heads, and they're then led into battle by deadly war leaders, coordinated storming the fort, not just mindlessly charging the gates. Ideally, it would play out as much like a PvP siege as possible, with a significantly more dynamic ebb and flow of battle, with a lot more tactical depth. Invasions might also have to scale with the number of players involved. I think this will be less of a problem in the actual game itself because of the actually working siege window and, of course, just a higher player base, but invasions are simply impossible with low numbers. I tried to get some footage for this video, but I couldn't really because everyone was too busy fighting in war, as of course they should be, and we died within seconds, thanks to our paltry squad of seven players. While we're on the topic of waves and repetition, let's address the elephant in the room. There is nowhere near enough content variety in PvE. Without going into the leveling stuff and questing, which believe me, we will, the basic endgame grind, particularly for gear and legendary weapons, is breach farming. This boils down to, you guessed it, killing waves of the same mobs before getting a sick sound effect and visual to cleanse the corruption. These are analogous to something like world quests in World of Warcraft or dynamic events in Guild Wars 2. The idea is actually pretty awesome. The entire land is darkened by horrific obelisks and portals, and the terrain itself is diseased with foul rituals. So, great work by the design team yet again. But look, there are probably a thousand, two thousand maybe or more events in Guild Wars 2. In New World, there are... Four tentacles, obelisks, portals, and hives. The portals and obelisks in Murkgaard are a bit different if you're feeling generous, but I don't think that really helps that much. I'm aware that there is some development time left over, but th there's some ground to be made up there. And it's not like breaches are the most riveting content in the universe, they're just waves of mobs to hack to pieces. Even in small groups they become trivial very quickly and they're just a mega grind to get legendary weapons. I will say it is quite funny to get some PvP going during the portals, because if you eliminate the enemy and then cleanse the land, they won't get any credit for it. Breaches also come in only one flavour, corruption. A good start will be extending out this mechanic to at least the Angry Earth and hopefully the Undead Pirates, who I'm particularly fond of. I think the complexity also needs to be seriously ramped up, to the point where the NPCs can form veritable mini-dungeons in your territory and have proper sprawling fortifications and defences, instead of these isolated breaches. If possible, I think this will be a great spot for some procedural generation, because you do start to recognize every crack in the obelisks after a while. You might think that, oh, it's just the end game where you encountered this repetition issue, but you'd be wrong. You can start doing the same portals from as early as level 25, all the way up to max level. Enemies do get more sophisticated AI and some extra moves as they get to higher levels, but it's essentially the same thing. This is mirrored in the questing. I really hope you like collecting bear asses and looting boxes, because that's exactly what you'll be doing from level 1 to 60. Now, I I don't have a big problem with this, as at the end of the day, that's what MMOs are to an extent, but I'd like to think we've advanced past the WoW Classic level of quest design to at least mask that fact. This is especially apparent when the quests start griefing you. They'll often ask you to walk across entire zones only to send you back, once again for pitiful experience gains, or just repeat literally the same objective in a slightly different area. My personal favourite is the legendary tower quests, which became a meme in my streams because in Everfall there are a massive amount of towers ringing the area. Very, very cool in terms of lore and landscaping, but not so cool when you get a quest to visit three of them. Turn it in, and then get another three towers to visit. You then realize it's going to make you do that for all of the towers. All 16 of them. 
After playing through pretty much all of New World, I can say in no uncertain terms that the amount of content developed for the game is bare bones at best. Turning in faction missions will quite often spit the same ones right back at you, some dungeons and areas are the exact same layout but recolored, boss level mobs are just regular mobs with masses of health and certain quest items are exact duplicates. The early stages of the game and the end stage are actually the most developed with some pretty fun quest chains at the beginning at the end in the higher level zones. Definitely sparse, but fairly solid. And you'll even have quests for some legendary weapons at max level, but the middle part of the game, well, I hope you like killing skeletons because there really isn't much else to it. Another massive issue I have with the design of the game is the very disappointing abandonment of open world PvP. Open world PvP is something I was really hoping New World would focus on, but nothing could be further from the truth. I spent a day or so going for PvP fights and I barely progressed at all, and at times I felt like going for PvP in the open world was actively stalling my progress. Which it was. Killing an enemy player grants no experience, no loot, and a fraction of a gold coin which is more of a troll than an actual reward at this point. Bear in mind, Amazon said in an interview that killing players in the open world would in fact be rewarded. I understand concerns about players farming each other for loot, but this is pretty easy to fix with diminishing returns for killing the same players. I don't mind if PvP isn't the most effective way to level or farm, that's fine. But when you feel like you're getting punished for playing PvP in a game with open world PvP, that's not a good look in my opinion. This is magnified when you realize that at Endgame, the only real reliable and meaningful PvP is the wars, which really don't take up much of your time. It's entirely possible you'll end up doing one or two wars a day, which for a start is only one activity, but it's also not a lot of playtime. Once you reach Endgame and get your gear set up, which is done exclusively through PvE, there is almost no PvP content to be had. I don't mind PvP for the sake of it, if it's fun, which it is, but the trouble there is with longevity. And to be honest, without some kind of context within the world itself, the PvP will find itself as a mini-game, not a part of the game and the world itself. This is a pretty good point to discuss New World's change in direction. New World started out as an open world PvP game, and now it's shifted more towards PvE. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like PvP and PvE. But the problem here is that the game is clearly torn in two somewhat and risks satisfying nobody. Currently, there is nowhere near enough PvE to draw PvE players away from other titles, and the PvP is in a similar situation. It's fun and works well when you get the opportunity to play it, but that might not happen that much. It's not that any of these systems are badly designed, quite the opposite. And despite my grumblings, I really don't mind the opt-in PvP system. Amazon has definitely made a solid implementation of that, combined with the PvP missions and territory control. But the trouble is, is that the two directions of the game cause some bizarre clashes that cause these systems to somewhat break down or be underdeveloped. Of course, I can't speak to what Amazon has in store, but I would be very impressed if they could expand the PvP system, triple the amount of PvE content at least, refine the combat, and then apply the layer of polish everybody expects from a AAA game in the time they have left. With my layman's understanding of witnessing other game development cycles, I would say this is a year-long task, if not more, and I have serious concerns for the game being released unfinished, which would be an extremely undesirable thing to happen. As when I play New World, I genuinely see the first of the next generation MMOs. And I mean that unironically. I'm going to get mean for that take, but I will stand by it. Amazon have something here, and if it goes to waste due to rush development, it'll be a heinous crime against gaming. While we are here, I want to talk about a few of the game's systems that are also a bit off. The camping system is another one that torn between PvP and PvE. Players can make a camp outside of a landmark and use it as a respawn point, with no cooldown. This will be fine in PvE situations, but it's a bit absurd for PvP, as it can lead to situations where you kill a player and they are back on you within seconds. I think it needs a cooldown if you die while opted in, or enemy players need to be able to destroy opted in players' camps, because right now, the system is just a clown fiesta. 
Loot and rewards are also a bit out of whack. You get so many drops that almost everything is pretty much completely worthless in the game, including gold. Just through my basic gameplay, I got more gold and resources than I knew what to do with. I ended up dropping or destroying a lot of it. Multiplied by a large company and also owning Winswood with maximum taxation. Well, I'm pretty sure we could just buy just about anything. This might be because of increased drop rates or something during the preview to ensure players could actually get stuff done, but it's worth a mention for sure. Endgame loot from Breaches is also pure RNG, which is fine, but I think there needs to be some kind of guarantee from the Spriggan chests and Merc Guard caches at the very least. I took down the Spriggan and I got a grey pair of gloves that weren't even remotely good. Considering this requires clearing all of Murkgaard to even attempt the beast, this sucks. The good news is, I actually really like how the crafting system is designed. Crafting is probably the way to go to create best-in-slot gear the most efficiently, and with less RNG than opening boxes and praying. By using Azoth, the mysterious currency used for teleporting around the place, you can guarantee at least one bonus you want on an item before crafting it. And you can in fact craft max item level gear, which will often be better than what players can consistently get from boxes. This puts a lot of value on having high crafting, and should maintain a healthy crafting-based economy, alongside giving players with the skills a good reputation. The exception to this is legendary gear, which as far as I can tell is obtained by doing legendary quests and high level corruption breaches. I also love that you can drop low level legendaries along the way. The drop rate seems fairly high, as even with my cursed luck, I was able to pick up a legendary longbow. It was complete garbage for my level, but it was orange and exciting. My only issue is that the legendaries from quests are significantly lower item level than the random ones, which isn't great. They should be of the same quality in my opinion. There are also some very weird foibles with the faction token loot system. Faction tokens are rewarded for doing faction missions, and the cap on how many you can have is very, very low. So you'll often find yourself forced to spend them or get overcapped. This is to prevent you hoarding them and instantly buying high level items when you unlock a higher cap and faction rank. I kind of understand this, but it really doesn't feel that great. It would be perhaps better to have faction token scale with the player level instead and have no faction token cap, because as you'll hear about later on, you really won't ever find yourself token starved. So all the cap ends up making you do is a little bit of running to and fro to the faction vendor whenever you need to dump your load. Additionally, I'd like to see a very high level, very prestigious level of faction armor that requires a massive grind to unlock, or maybe even owning a claim for a long duration to purchase. Current max level faction gear is actually pretty powerful and has some very strong perks attached to it, in addition to a stat boosting socket, but it will eventually be rendered completely obsolete by drops or crafting, so I'd like to see a proper super endgame faction set. They are also very, very boring perks. Nothing about plus five stab resistance really convinces me my generic looking helmet is one a member of the glorious Covenant would wear. I'd love to see a bit more faction flavor in the weapons and armor from a faction. The only thing exclusive to them right now are cosmetic differences, which aren't even really that significant, to be honest. Faction gear should have a playstyle associated with it. For example, Marauder gear could have a lot of perks or even unique perks oriented around very direct combat. Syndicate could be more sneaky and underhand focused, and Covenant could be about purging heretics in fire. It writes itself, really. Concerns about balance might understandably prevent unique perks from being too much of a thing, but at the very least, I want to see a bit more creativity than 5% thrust reduction. One more very weird thing about the faction system is that doing faction missions is actually not a brilliant way to get faction tokens. Doing breaches gives you an absolutely insane amount of tokens, at around three to five times the rate of doing missions approximately. Of course, the missions are meant for territory control, but this balance seems a little off to me. As breaches are already going to be the main source of endgame loot on their own, we could hardly discuss factions without talking about territory control, which is, after all, a big component of the game. First off, territory capture. 
Completing PvP faction missions increases your influence over a territory and decreases the other two factions' influence. If an enemy faction gets to 100%, they can declare war and then try to take over. This sounds solid on paper, but I don't think Amazon quite realized what they created here, because every single enemy player is essentially taking over your territory. You want to kill all of them. And I mean all of them. Ganking 20 versus 1 is not just encouraged in New World, it is optimal to do so. Personally, I don't mind that. It's open world PvP, it's part of the game in an absurd way, and I think this sort of thing can really lead to some amusing open voice situations. Although, sadly, the open voice wasn't really working that well for me in the preview, so I wasn't able to experience that firsthand just yet. If you die with PvP missions, they all reset, which can actually be a pretty big time nuke if you've got a lot done, so you are heavily incentivized to avoid death and run away from conflicts you aren't sure about. This is a solid system because it can get very, very tense when trying to escape a superior force or when engaging a duel. But when your opponent decides to run, which happens quite a lot, it's quite frustrating because of how easy it is to escape with the life staff. Life Staff has a dash ability that is on a fairly short cooldown, and if yours isn't off cooldown when someone uses it to escape, well, they're gone, and you can't really catch them anymore, even if you have more players sometimes. I think the developers actually made Life Staff specifically for this purpose because they want to allow players to get out of really bad spots, which, for all the cross-country sessions it's caused me, I'm actually inclined to agree with the developer's decision here. And it does lend to a lot of really fun gameplay in abusing terrain and awesome moves in war, so I don't have a problem with the ability as such. I think it could maybe use a cooldown increase or a longer wind-up animation, but it should stay. It adds to the game. The way to address the whole running away thing is probably just to incentivize actual PvP in the missions more. I talked about this a little bit earlier in the sense of adding some massive open world PvP objectives, but I think even the missions could have alternative objectives such that killing players also progresses the quests, or even magnifies the effect of completing the quest, for example, granting more influence. You could argue that players would abuse this by killing each other on alt accounts or something, and this could be addressed with diminishing returns and detecting when the same player is getting farmed, but that aside, Let's be honest here, this is a territory game. People are going to get big egos, they're going to get sweaty, and this system is getting abused one way or another. Whether it's going to be multi-boxing or alt accounts or cross-faction collusion, the faction territory system will be manipulated by the players for their own ends. And that's part of the fun, to be honest, and the essence of the player-driven content that will hopefully be the soul of New World. So, the territory system is pretty solid, with a few amusing consequences, but what happens when you actually get to attack the territory? Well, this is where the developers take their revenge for all the griefing in the early alpha, and grief the player base incredibly hard. Any company belonging to the attacking faction can put themselves forward after a conflict period is started, where a faction has increased their influence to 100%. Then, after a short timer, the company that gets to try to take over the territory is randomly chosen. This is actual trolling. Uh, this is intended to make it so that even small companies can have a go at claiming territory, but it's just incredibly unfair and does not reward effort or time investment whatsoever. In fact, this happened to me. I spent an entire evening with my company grinding out brainless missions at the same three locations, and we pretty much did the entire influence bar, only for it to be sniped by another company who didn't do anything. Needless to say, we crushed the filthy syndicate, but I have to say, it didn't feel great not to be able to reap the sweet, sweet taxes. I think that percentage contribution to influence should at the very least massively weight the chances in favor of companies, if not outright give them priority. If Amazon are really set on allowing small companies a shot, then have participation scale based on the size of companies, so larger companies need to orchestrate effectively, and not just flat out zerg everything. But literally anything 
is better than complete randomness. In my opinion, this cannot exist this way for release. It will breed a massive amount of discontent towards members of the same faction, which should never be the case. And that's another thing. The faction system as it is means that if you want a certain territory, you are actively disincentivized to help a fellow faction company. Because if they win, whether attacking or defending, you can't get it anymore because they're on your faction. And even worse, you're even motivated to help the opposing faction win so you can get your chance later on. The developers kind of thought of this by limiting the company size to 50, I think, and made it so a company can only have one siege window. So in other words, holding multiple territories is significantly harder as you won't be able to field your full company in every battle and you'll need to rely on your faction. The thing is, this won't work because players with sufficiently large communities will just make massive multi-company alliances that either control different territories or, of course, simply act as mercenaries for the main company that controls everything. This already happened in the preview, I believe, and will be far more prevalent in release. And I certainly predict that servers will have a dominant faction and then one or more factions that have significantly less power. Fortunately, wars are limited to 50v50, so being outnumbered doesn't necessarily shut you out of territory control, but the open world, where you've got to do your PvP missions to even attack, might end up being a very, very dangerous place. So, how do we fix this? Well, for the dominant faction thing, it's a very difficult one. I think factions with less territory should have bonuses to experience to encourage more players to join and level up quicker. And for the in-faction griefing, there need to be way more bonuses for your faction owning territory. Prime among them would just be 50% reduced taxes, or even better, crafting bonuses for faction members. It's insane to me that I can't even make my own company exempt from my extortionate taxation. That sort of thing should motivate companies to cooperate a bit more, especially seeing as holding more than one territory will probably end up being a bit of a pain. Speaking of experience bonuses, opting into PvP grants 10% extra experience. 10% is not as bad as it sounds because doing PvP missions is massively better experience than doing regular ones, especially as you can do them both simultaneously. But that is still borderline insulting. It should probably be pushing 50% in addition to significant bonuses to gathering and loot drops. The reasons for the latter is that at max level, the experience is irrelevant and the endgame zones have no territory to control, so the players are highly incentivized to opt out and work together to make the content easier, instead of actually having these epic high-risk conflict zones. Opting into PvP should just straight up be an advantage at endgame because of the increased risk. As it stands, it's a strict disadvantage for endgame farming, as it's harder to work with other players and they can also potentially kill you. And, well, opted out players simply won't care either way. There is no resource control in New World. This is obviously pretty out of whack. Again, I don't mind PvP for the sake of it, but I'm also not a fan of artificially handicapping myself and getting punished for engaging in a core gameplay system. It's highly likely that most players as I observed in the preview, will opt out in endgame zones just for this reason, which is the exact opposite of how it should be in my opinion. Moving back to attacking territory though, we arrive at war, a much more positive topic. War is good. Well, at least it is in New World. It's a lot of fun to play, and if you look at it for what it is, you will definitely see a well done system that has a lot of room for interesting strategy and teamwork. I would have preferred it to be open world PvP, I think it's inherently more interesting. No timers, multi-faction backstabbing, insane outnumbered holds, and well, just the sheer spectacle of massive open world PvP is the way to go in my opinion. But that isn't what war is, and so we can't judge it as such. War is 50v50 PvP, attackers versus defenders. Defenders set up their siege and need to prevent their main capture point from being taken inside their fort. Before the attackers can even think about that, they need to capture three external rally points outside the fort, then break the gates down before finally capturing the point. All while respawn times for players are increasing. 
Siege is very, very powerful, and handling enemy siege and constructing your own, even as the attackers, is key to success. You can do some funny stuff like build a machine gun that can fire through the gate after you take it down, and even blow people up with kegs. I have to give it to the developers here. It's a fun interpretation of Siege Warfare. In terms of design, I think it works. The attackers slowly encroach on the point before pushing the gates, and there's this constant push and pull as players try to rotate around the map effectively and destroy each other's siege while avoiding death themselves. The 30 minute timer constantly reminding you that you've either just got to hold on that little bit longer or that you are running out of time before the defenders put you into their cringe compilation. It's here that you see the true vision for the combat system. Frontline tanks appear with heavy control effects while being healed with supportive players. Mages coordinate deadly firestorms and archers and sword or hatchet wielding assassins trying to pick off stragglers to help the war effort. Or while a deadly rain of fire hails down from the fort. It's a battlefield out there and War in New World captures the chaos of battle very, very well. It's hard to say just exactly who has the advantage in the siege, because I don't think anyone was sufficiently organized or optimized enough to say. I would be inclined to lean towards the defender, because that's usually how it goes, and maybe how it should be. I never felt particularly threatened while defending, even while slightly outnumbered, and siege can seriously pack a punch. Attacking also becomes more difficult as time goes on too, as the defenders have fewer and fewer points to hold on, and everyone just piles in. If you don't get stuff done early as an attacker, you're probably doomed to watch the defenders stall you out at the last hurdle. I didn't get to attack that much because I was constantly under siege by peasants complaining about taxes, but when we eventually had a go, we were able to successfully take over a fort with a few minutes to spare. We had a lot of issues pushing through the gates, but maybe we just need to get good. We only had around 20 of us on voice, so that obviously didn't help, but still. Choke points are very, very scary with no target cap. New World's War is almost certainly going to be the pinnacle of the game. It's a shame they couldn't make it work in open world, but I do understand the developer's desire to make a more balanced environment to dictate territory control. And they succeeded. Like I said before, if you look at it for what it is and not what you want it to be, war is executed well. I only hope there is enough of it, as it's only half an hour long, and wars could even overlap with each other potentially. I would love to see a perhaps less territorially impactful but more prevalent or lengthy implementation of a warlike battle in open world, because with war being the main PvP fix of the game, players might find themselves with limited daily action. If open world PvP isn't going to be refocused on, then additional game modes like Team Deathmatch are probably in order, and even friendly siege battles between companies could be an option, in addition to, of course, the glaringly missing feature of proper duels. Players on the same faction currently have no way to settle their differences other than harsh language, but on a serious note, not being able to PvP with one third of the factions just limits your options for no real reason, which will also be much more impactful for the dominant faction. Following on from war is the business of territory management. I also really like the system. It gives a great deal of agency to the player and a sense of permanent influence over the very game itself, which is a rare thing indeed. Governors can set various tax rates to harvest coin from the populace and is a great motivation to take down the oppressors. It gave me great joy to inform the disgusting syndicate and marauders that taxes will indeed be staying maxed out after we successfully held Windswood for the entire preview. Again, the depth is where things might need to change. Fully upgrading everything really won't take that long in the grand scheme of things, and after that you'll just be spamming upgrades for bonuses that apply to citizens, for crafting and some aspects of combat. These are arguably pretty overpriced too, especially considering the very paltry sum of gold required to upgrade structures. The gold income, even with extreme taxes in one of the more populated zones in the game, only netted us around 200,000 gold, which it's definitely nice, but I personally farmed up around 80,000, I think, just by playing the game. So in perspective, it's really not that much. And to make spamming the boosts worth it, you'll really have to have a lot of throughput. 
The system itself, though, is well designed, along with the player housing system, which is required for citizenship. After gaining enough reputation in a region by killing enemies, completing quests, or doing breaches and so on, you'll be able to purchase one of a few houses with different layouts in a settlement, thus becoming a citizen. Citizens have to pay a property tax, but get very nice bonuses to crafting, gathering, and other activities. You also get a free port location that you can recall to from the world, which is very handy for getting about the place. As you develop your network towards endgame, the running simulator definitely decreases. The housing system itself is solid as far as I can tell, and you can really get some fun decoration going on, and even compete in a leaderboard to make your house the most fabulous and the default one shown off to people having a look around, which is a very nice flourish. Nothing really to complain about here. However, it is worth noting I am not a big participator in player housing, so I could have no idea what I'm talking about. That's it. Just about all my thoughts on the current state of New World as of the end of the preview on September 4th, 2020. I tried to be as exhaustive as possible to give a true clear picture of where the game is, what it's about, and where I think its strengths and weaknesses are. But if you have any questions or want to know my opinion on something, then leave me a comment and I'll try and reply. If you made it all this way, then job well done. If you skipped here to get my conclusion, then I won't keep you any longer. In conclusion, New World is a game that has very obviously done a 180 in development direction, and that manifests strongly in the somewhat sparse amount of actual content in the game and a few underdeveloped or missing systems. However, the baseline mechanics and a brilliantly realized world show a huge amount of promise, and I want to make it clear that although I definitely didn't mess around when criticizing some areas of the game, I think it was constructive, with respect for the developer's vision, and demonstrated that at the end of the day, I consider it to be one of the most promising upcoming titles out there right now, MMO or otherwise. If Amazon Game Studio give New World the time it needs, if that's six months, a year, or two, I have very high hopes for the game, and I genuinely can't wait to get back into it as soon as I can, whether that be for a public or a private test. The developers know what they're doing, and as long as they stick to a strong design philosophy, New World will be a pretty bold and different game. Not quite as brave as its original incarnation, but certainly separate enough from the regular MMO pack to have a unique selling point of a blend of open world territory control with heavy crafting and PvE elements, which, at its base level, is fun to play and is a fresh experience, at least for me. Iron out the mechanics and add a whole lot more of everything and it's job done. It really is as simple as that, right? I really wasn't expecting this video to go this long. What can I say? I'm passionate about MMO gaming and I had a lot of fun in the preview, so I wanted to share my entire experience and also provide some feedback. It took an absolutely behemoth effort to get it coherent and, I hope, well-structured. I want to give a massive thanks to Jernert, who edited this monstrosity, and also to my company and friends who provided some supplementary footage and, of course, were at my beck and call during the preview to help me poke it a bit and make sure the Covenant had plenty of taxation without representation. I wish Amazon the very best of luck in their development cycle and eagerly wait further updates. Hopefully this video contains some useful feedback and don't worry if it's totally ignored, I won't cry that much. To the rest of you, thanks for watching and I'll see you all on the desolate shores of Eternum.